And the book is on why war should end, not a war, but war itself should end. My claim is it's time to really take that on fully seriously. Anyway, the book is in, has three foci, really. Uh, one is what I call the business of war, which is what I'll talk about this morning. The second is called the anger of war. Uh, humans have more anger than we need to survive. Just as we have more sexuality than we need to survive, we also have more anger than we need to survive. I'm calling it excess anger. It could also be called in a more Marxist way, surplus anger. But we do have more anger than we need. And in all societies, anger arises naturally from intimate situations, work, family, school, whatever. You know, um, That's one form of anger. I claim there's a second form. I call it personal anger. Second form of anger I call social anger, which is the anger that comes from hating war, racism, sexism, homophobia, whatever. And I try to work on, uh, uh, on some of what these kinds of anger are about. The third section of, of this part of the book is called the, the masculinity of war. And I claim that uh, the ultimate expression of normative masculinity is the warrior. And um, the warrior is a, is a man, who, although there are women now too. Uh, the women who do it, do it copying the male model, actually. There's no woman model for a warrior that I can see. And uh, the male warrior is someone who is resolute, strong, tough, uh, uh, heartless, if called upon, and absolutely deferential to authority. Right? So that's what the book is about. Then the second part of the book goes into the, the business of peace, the anger of peace, and the masculinity of peace. So I'm going to talk about the business end of it now, but I want to just read two paragraphs here that uh, encapsulate one part of what I'm driving at. Consider that at this very moment, $13 billion is being spent in our country, on, this is in the United States, of course, on building three nuclear submarines. It is understood by everyone involved in their construction that they will never be used, that they are not meant to be used, and that we already have more nuclear submarines than we need even to fight a war that could destroy the world. There's no submarine threat to us or any other major war threat coming from anywhere. Hyman Rickover, the admiral who created the nuclear submarine program, said at the end of his career that there was never need for more than one nuclear submarine anyway, we had 40, uh, that all the nuclear missiles on just one of them would be adequate to destroy many countries, possibly even the entire planet. Um, there is no way we need in any conceivable uh, way another nuclear submarine, let alone three. Nor do we need to spend hundreds of billions of dollars on fighter planes that will almost certainly never be used. The F-35 fighter now underway is to cost $113 million per plane. The military plans to buy 2,450 of these for a total cost of about $376 billion, or about half what the Pentagon budget is this year. Um, how does anyone figure how many such planes need to be in the U.S. military arsenal? Uh, whom do they imagine the planes attacking? Suppose 10%, even just 1%, of that much money were put into planning for peace and learning how to resolve conflicts peacefully. All that is possible right now, but moving in that direction would mean admitting that peace is cheaper and more attractive than war and that war is becoming outmoded and that it would be no longer necessary or moral to let investors make money off producing and selling the tools of mass murder. So we're talking about war material as, as a good part of what the business involvement in war is. Uh, Marx uh, wrote over a hundred years ago that capitalism is the first and only economic system invented by humans that is more efficient than it needs to be. And the surplus productivity, which is inevitable in that system, has to go somewhere. Uh, it can go to war, it can go to armaments, as Marx said it would. And we know now, and it was not foreseeable in Marx's time, it also goes to consumerism. You know, one can make ever greater numbers of things that people don't need or even want until it's hammered on them and so on. But I want to talk about the war part. War is partly a way of keeping an economic system going. That is, we, we put money into making uh, stuff, making lots and lots of stuff. The stuff doesn't have to be used. When the Saudis buy 100 fighter planes or whatever we're selling them now, it doesn't matter they'll probably never use them. What matters is that they buy them, right? And uh, they may or may not use them. They probably won't. So the first part of my <coughs> analysis of, of capitalism, really, and war, uh, is war material. Uh, war material is a big part of what we do. The defense industry, many years ago, figured it would be clever and successful to make sure there were major defense uh, installations in every state of the country. So every congressperson, every senator has something at stake in keeping that stuff going. Even Teddy Kennedy, even the great Teddy Kennedy from my state of Massachusetts, wanted to make sure we had defense industries going because they keep people employed, all right? Mm -hmm. 
My argument in the book is making typewriters would also keep people employed, as would horses, as would buggies for horses, uh, and uh, telegraph systems. But we don't need those anymore. <laughs> we don't need them anymore, and we don't make them anymore. But we do make uh, we make this. Anyway, so the first part then is is the business in the business war is war material. The second part is something which is fairly new in the history of war, I think, which is the reconstruction of what has been destroyed. Uh, we all know about Halliburton and Bechtel and so on and so forth. The money is made at, at rebuilding what you have just destroyed. It's, uh, it's not in this context, but in other contexts, somebody has defined capitalism. He says it works this way. At night, somebody goes around breaking your windows, and in the morning, they come by and sell you glass. Okay? <laughs> and it does, right? At night, we go around breaking their windows, and in the morning, we sell them glass. Now, what happens is then that more and more companies, this accelerated under Bush the second, of course, uh, make vast amounts of money uh, doing the reconstruction uh, in the country uh, that has been destroyed. So they make money uh, destroying and they make money rebuilding and it's a pretty good system if the whole point is to uh, make money. Now what happens in reconstruction that most people don't know is that most of it is a fraud. Most of it is totally a fraud. I'll just uh, quote a few pieces here from, uh, from my book in fact. Um, it must be understood not only that much federal money has gone to private contractors like Halliburton that make great profits at the public's expense, but also that much of what is produced is not satisfactory by any stretch of anyone's imagination. Studies show that schools, that the major, three major companies were paid to rebuild were left into shambles, and that many power plants, telephone exchanges, and sewage and sanitation systems which were to be repaired or replaced by the big three companies Halliburton, Bechtel, and KBR were either not repaired at all or were fixed so badly as to be unusable. Halliburton itself spent $40 million searching for weapons of mass destruction. None, of course, were found. It is clear that the point of these contracts is not to rebuild Iraq so much as to make money for the contractors. As with much of our economic system, money for the sake of money takes precedence over quality, integrity, and even fulfillment of contract obligations. In one class action suit, Joshua Eller, a civilian who worked for the U.S. Air Force in 2006 at the Balad Air Force Base northeast of Baghdad, alleges that KBR supplied U.S. forces with food that was expired, spoiled, rotten, or contaminated, and with water that was not safe to drink. But my claim is that Shadi is still with us, in fact. The shoddy is what the reconstruction is about. It doesn't matter whether anything works, and it doesn't matter whether a hospital that's rebuilt, uh, uh, is rebuilt adequately, properly, uh, or anything else. So the point is that huge fortunes are made off reconstruction as well as off making more material. The third part of my argument, which I can't do anything with because I can't find anything, any data on it, is that banks make money off war. Banks loan money to corporations that make things for war, okay? There is a book from many years ago called The Crime and Punishment of I.G. Farben, yeah. uh, which shows the American involvement in, uh, in this. And in fact, I used to show a movie years ago in, in a class uh, where there was documentary footage of uh, the Nazi government decorating with medals uh, officials of Ford and General Motors for helping to reindustrialize Germany so that the war was possible. Okay, and the fourth part of, of, of my uh, little uh, shtick on, on the business and war is, of course, that war serves the purposes of business, right? <laughs> the corporations uh, play a gigantic role in setting foreign policy. Uh, it's kind of eerie, I think, to read, as we do endlessly, about the Iraq war, and the oil issue is barely mentioned you know, anywhere. Uh, it's foreign policy this, or it's foreign policy that, or it's... Uh, uh, Obama's uh, cowardice, pardon? Somebody, oh. um, but the, the, this doesn't need to be developed, that we all know that corporations play a, a large role in uh, helping design and, and maintain our foreign policy. And of course, it can now be argued that, that governments are there, at least governments like that of the United States, to help um, keep businesses doing what they want. You know, I mean, it's, it's unclear whether the businesses Government serves the business, the business serves the government, or you know what the relationship is, but, but, but we know. Anyway, so that's kind of the, the idea of, of, of uh, how business is, is involved in war. And what I'm trying to suggest in, in, in the section I call the business of peace is how uh, we can at least begin rethinking, um, uh, rethinking the whole issue of business and war and restructuring the whole, the whole damn relationship. I suggest an analogy with federal supports for farmers Farmers are paid not to grow food. You know that? They're paid not to grow food, all right? And it works, you know. Uh, he's a big farmer, here's the money, just don't grow the food. I'm suggesting we pay arms manufacturers not to make arms. <laughs> the whole point is the profit, right? If you want the profit, take the profit and don't make the stuff. We'll be a, a step ahead 
if we have them having the money but we have no stuff, right? The next step is, of course, don't pay them to not make the stuff or to make the stuff. But I think there's something uh, eerie about the notion that we, in a certain weird rational way in the capitalist system, pay farmers not to grow food, uh, but we don't pay arms manufacturers not, yes. not, not to pay or make arms. And I think that uh, that's a piece of, uh, of what needs to be done. Another part of my argument about the business of peace is uh, goes back to about 30 years to uh, uh, the notion of uh, shifting an economy from more production to economic conversion, it was called then, and still is barely among people who talk about it. But I want to suggest uh, some thoughts about economic conversion. And uh, this would fit very well with a, a book I'm reading right now about how Germany, I didn't know this until reading this book, in, in Germany, uh, corporations all have workers on the board of the, of the company. And uh, by law, they have to be 50 percent of, the, of, of them, and, and it, it's quite interesting. I mean, German business is doing quite well, although we're told it's not. Uh, it turns out it really uh, quite is. In any event, um, yeah, this goes back to the 70s in Britain, where a company named Lucas uh, Aerospace Industry, Aerospace. pardon? You know, Lucas you know the case. Yeah. yeah. Lucas employed 18,000 workers at 15 plants throughout England. It produced combat aircraft for Britain and the Stingray missile for NATO. Nearly half its business was military related, mostly in making warplanes, but it also manufactured medical apparatuses. When the news came that the government intended to purchase no more military planes from Lucas, the company's workers offered a proposal that would save the company and also their jobs. Get the details here, it's extraordinary. During two years of discussion and planning, unionized engineers, technicians, line workers, and secretaries reviewed the equipment and labor skills available at Lucas sites and argued that military production was not a desirable way to use them. Market research suggested that manufacturing medical equipment like kidney dialysis machines would allow Lucas to continue to employ its workforce and would produce something that the workers and other staff would feel better about than the military material they'd been making. The plan also included proposals for designing and manufacturing artificial limb control systems, aids for the blind, a vehicle that would allow children suffering from spina bifida to move around, and improved life support systems for ambulances. The plan suggested focusing on using renewable resources for energy and more efficient ways to conserve and use energy. Proposals <coughs> included making cheap heat pumps for use in homes, solar cells and fuel cells, this is in the 70s, and windmills and other alternative forms of energy. The plans also included developing lightweight, efficient public transportation systems that would work on both rails and roads, an auto engine much like the hybrid designs used recently in braking systems. Proposals included undersea exploration machinery and remote control technology. The plan went further than these many intriguing recommendations. It also questioned the wisdom of manufacturing war machinery that steered money and inventiveness away from their potential uses for meeting real human needs and desires. It acknowledged that the owners of Lucas made much money off producing the war material, uh, but was not useful, uh, material that was uh, useful for war, but not for the rest of British society. It was a most intriguing proposal, but it failed for two reasons. Management resented workers suggesting what they should do, and union leaders, union leaders found the proposal too radical. Wage and working conditions were as far as they were usually accustomed to go in the past, and a threat to their ongoing power over the workers. The Labor Party itself did not welcome the plan's critique of capitalism and its undemocratic ways. The plan included a transition from management control to a plan democratically decided by everyone in the factories. Those who organized the plan did not opt for direct action to try to implement it, and failed to get support from management, union leaders, and the British government. The proposal died. I mean, think of that. Here is a gorgeous democratic uh, upsurge of people saying, this is what we can do to keep going. And not only does the uh, owner, the management say, no, we'd rather close the factory now than, than, than yield to this, but the unions don't want to do it either, right? So we're talking a complex uh, critical analysis here. And then very, I'll, I'll make this really, really fast, and then I'll have to end. A very similar story uh, took place in the 1980s in the Four River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts, where the South Shore Conversion Project, which was peopled by workers and peace activists, offered a proposal to shift the plant and its 6,000 workers from building naval ships no longer needed to prefabricated housing and ocean thermal plant ships. As with Lucas, plant and jobs would have been saved, but management wanted no part of it and had the power to close the shipyard instead and did, okay? So, so you know, the, the political issue here is how does one, it, not how does one get the workers and secretaries and everyone together to do the planning, but what's the politics of how you move then uh, to get this implemented? And I think this is, I would say, my, my topic is not the peace movement quite the same way both of yours is, but that this would have to be a central part of a peace movement is how to take economic confusion, how to renew the concept of economic conversion, how to take it seriously, and how to figure out the politics uh, of making it work. The, all the groundwork is there for making it work, but the political savvy is not.